Hello friends, welcome to another episode of BioNews. Today I have five papers to discuss with you guys, beginning with a paper by Jagannathan et al. In this paper, Jagannathan et al. considered the influence of the APOL1 variant on kidney disease. For those that don't know, APOL1 is a gene that has one SNP, one signal, single nucleotide polymorphism, that dramatically affects the kidney deterioration rates in people. In fact, it is thought that the reason African Americans have such tremendously worsening kidney function compared to Caucasians and Asians is because of the predominance of the APOL1 variant among them that is dangerous. So in this paper, it's a meta-analysis of 10 studies investigating the role of the high-risk APOL1 variant in both chronic kidney disease as well as end-stage renal uh, disease. So what they found was that people with APOL1 uh, high-risk variants were 1.4x more likely to develop chronic kidney disease, 40% more likely. Significant enough to think that if you were ever going to use androgens, you'd want to know your APOL1 variant first. Um, second, they found that those people with APOL1 high-risk variants were 1.7 times more likely to go from chronic kidney disease to end-stage renal failure or end-stage renal disease. But they didn't actually find that people with APOL1 variants were independently more risky, uh, more um, likely to enter into end stage renal failure, end stage renal disease without entering into chronic kidney disease. This is a little detail, but anyway, the point is they're much more likely to get chronic kidney disease and then far more likely to develop into end stage uh, renal failure or end stage renal disease. They're also, they develop 0.55 more decline in EGFR per year compared to people with a low risk APOL1 genotype. And a second paper by Barbagello et al. This paper examined um, um, lipid changes in people with chronic kidney disease and people who get renal transplants, kidney transplants after chronic kidney disease. I didn't know about this, but there's apparently a lipid nephrotoxicity hypothesis that was originally proposed about 30 years ago basically a cholesterol-related dyslipidemia hypothesis of chronic kidney disease progression. Um, basically, it proposed that dyslipidemia was thought to worsen anthro, uh, atherothrombotic events, nephrotoxicity, glomerulosclerosis, and chronic kidney disease. Uh, for example, it's known that oxidized LDL produces a pro-inflammatory ROS-laden environment that injures glomerul epithelial cells and endothelial cells. So there is certainly a method by which having poor lipids, bad cholesterol, could worsen kidney disease. Now in this paper, what they found was that people with chronic kidney disease tended to have higher triglycerides, higher LDL cholesterol, higher lipoprotein little a, interestingly, and higher ApoBs. They also had lower HDL cholesterols and lower uh, ApoA1 uh, biomarkers. Now the reverse happened when they experienced renal transplantation. Everything changed except for a couple of interesting things. LDLC, low density lipoprotein cholesterol, remained high, and APOB, the proteins on uh, LDL cholesterol, for example, and other cholesterols, remained high. This is really fascinating because I wonder why people remain in dyslipidemia after getting the renal transplant. What is it about their medication or lifestyle that keeps them in a dyslipidemia with higher LDL cholesterols? Interestingly, People with chronic kidney disease from stages two to four do not, experiences, uh, do not experience uh, improvements in their uh, mortality from taking statins. But people in chronic kidney disease stage five do. Anyway, uh, the next paper by uh, Goncalves et al. I hope I typed that right in my notes and it's not Gonzalez et al. But anyway, Goncalves et al. Uh, this paper is a pharmacologic in vivo study on rodents using selective receptor antagonists and mechanical insults to cause injury and pain to the rodents. What they found that was that blocking cannabinoid 1 receptor, CB1, increased the amount of pain rodents felt. But this was not the case when they blocked CB2, the two cannabinoid main receptors. Interestingly, they found that blocking the Mu opioid receptor and the Kappa opioid receptor both worsened pain sensations, but blocking the Delta opioid receptor didn't, which that I've known about a little bit from before, but I didn't know as much about the cannabinoid receptors. So it seems that CB2 and the DOR, Delta opioid receptor, are not involved in hyperalgesia or nociception in some way, or maybe they're not that involved in it. 
Uh, a paper by Bray et al. considered, now we're going to discuss a GLP-1 agonist for two papers. A paper by Bray et al. considered this interesting observation that people on glucagon-like pept uh, peptide 1 receptor agonists, GLP-1 agonists, which is something that Derek and I and Steve have been talking about recently, they tend to experience um, uh, a reduced, uh, they tend to experience some kind of cardiovascular and renal protection. But it's unclear how this happens exactly. So these authors hypothesize that it may be coming because of a reduced inflammation in the bodies of people on GLP-1 agonists. So they did a randomized, con uh, they, uh, sorry, they did a meta-analysis of 40 randomized controlled trials. They found that reductions in C-reactive protein, tumor necrosis factor alpha, and melondialdehyde, which is called MDA, were consistent. They also found that significant reductions in systolic blood pressure among people on GLP-1 agonists was tied directly to their C-reactive protein lowering, not just to their, well, maybe also to their obesity lowering. I don't know if they controlled for that. I, wasn't, I don't know if I was able to see the entire paper. They also found increases in adiponectin across the people. Now, that brings us to our next paper by Cementel uh, Mendia et al. This paper was a meta-analysis of 20 randomized controlled trials on glucagon-like peptide 1 receptor agonists. And what they found here was a consistent rise in uh, serum adiponectin. Adiponectin is an anti-inflammatory hormone synthesized by adipocytes, the fat cells in our body. It re its uh, amount in our serum reduces during obesity as well as during metabolic dysfunction. And it is anti-inflammatory. So it's really fascinating to see that GLP-1 agonists increase adiponectin, decrease inflammation across the body. Is this due to them in, uh, eating less only or not? That's something I think they'll have to tease out in future papers. Thank you guys so much for bearing with me. I'll see you next time with another episode of BioNews.